All right, so let's just try and record this. All right. How should we do the intro? This is the first one. Uh, I don't know. All right, well, how about this? Welcome to the Hammer, Hammer Factor. Let me start that over. I can't already stutter. Mm. Welcome to the Hammer Factor, your whitewater, mm, your adventure sports podcast. Welcome to the Hammer Factor, your favorite podcast. In studio today, we have John Weld, kayaking legend and mm. owner of Immersion Research. Mm-hmm. John, this is yes. our first first podcast. Um, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. And how are you? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. I am uh, technically struggling with how we're going to make this happen, but I think we are on the right path. That's right. Uh, we'll start with baby steps. Exactly. See where it takes us. Exactly. We have to start somewhere. Okay. Right. So what we're going to do, and we've briefly discussed this, and when I say briefly, like 30 seconds. Um, if we're, that. We're going to discuss a few hot topics that may be in the whitewater or mountain biking or outdoor adventure sport area. Um, you are officially our whitewater expert. And we're going to go through some news items, cover a little gossip. Um, hopefully, I get like it. gossip. I know, I know. This this is why uh, you're going to be in charge of that column. Excellent. And then we'll end with a little rant or rave about really anything that has been on your radar. Let's see how this goes. We've got a topic that I sent over to you. Did you have a chance to look at that link on Facebook about the sick line race? I studied it. I studied it like the LSATs, like I was studying for the LSATs. <laughs> All right. Well, give me, get, tell me what you saw and and what and what your thoughts are. Well, I, I think what you sent me, uh, and I'd heard something about this, was that the sick line, you know, sick line race is now imposing boat restrictions. Is that do I sum this up correctly? Essentially, there were some boats that were too light to race, and some racers did not know about this too light to race rule until just after they had signed up. So I think that's where the either misunderstanding or controversy comes back, uh, comes from, but that's, that's the way I understand it. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I see the problem here and it's a legitimate problem and it's one that sick line needs to figure out, uh, for this race series to work. I mean, it is a legitimate concern and I don't see that they have a, a good answer just quite yet. Uh, if you'd look back to slalom racing, and as you know, I built slalom boats for many years, um, including the gold medal C2 nice. for the 92 Olympics. Nice. Uh, Not so a lot I know of people know about that. Not a lot no, of people it, know about that. No, they don't. It's a little, a little bit of arcane trivia. So, uh, so in slalom, it, it, we had a pretty good system in the sense that a boat design would come out, like Richard Fox would design a boat, uh, design a boat for the upcoming worlds, you know, two years ahead of time. And that boat design would get distributed amongst boat manufacturers worldwide. And for instance, I work for Valley Mill Boats. We would get a hold of that boat design, and anybody who bought boats from us would have access to that to that uh, that that shape. Okay. And you know, there was five or six or seven popular race designs being you know thrown around every year. Um, and then we had restrictions. You know, those boats had to be a certain length and a certain width. But it was a very egalitarian system. You know, and basically, so, someone who is in Eastern Europe who may not uh, have access to um, high-tech materials or whatever, you, you, they could still get a boat that was going to be competitive. Um, right. You know, there was a there was a, a very short window in the 80s where Log Bill and Hearn, who had access to, you know, carbon Kevlar and, and foam core boats that a lot of racers didn't, were coming to the races with 11-pound one-time race boats, which was put them at a very competitive advantage. Um, but the race rules, uh, you know, obviated that advantage, which was or, or, you know, got rid of that advantage, which is I think a good system. Um, but a couple things that were working for them. One was that these athletes were not sponsored by boat companies, right? Okay. Uh, they would not be beholden to the company to provide their boat. Let me, um, let me interrupt you real quick. Were the yeah. events sponsored by any boat companies themselves? No, okay. no, these were, I see, you know, these were races put on by, you know, the international governing committee. And obviously it's a different sport. You know, we don't have that necessarily in whitewater, but it shows what the obstacle that, that Sickline has to face in this regard. You know, we see a little bit of this even in regional races like the Upper Yacht Race where someone can come in with a, a little bit different boat and win a boat class, you know, because it's harder to find. But 
Um, you know, the problem now is that you go to the sick line race, and if you're sponsored by Dagger, you have to use a Dagger boat. And that can mean the difference between winning or losing that race, plain and simple. Right. Uh, and these boat restrictions, because there is so many different kinds of boats, I mean, how are you going to wrangle these boats into one fair class? I don't see how it's possible. You know, there's two sides to it, the way I see it. One side is the regulations are really um, acting as an impediment to advancements in technology and design. Uh, the other side of it is... We'll call, we'll call that the Corin School. Okay, we'll call, we'll call it the Corin School. Right. The, the other side of it is that with these boats, um, like you say, it offers an unfair advantage to not only if you have the boat, if you can get it there, if there are some elements of safety. But basically, I think, um, to the best of my understanding, uh, understanding on this, is that they're trying to level the playing field for all of the racers. Absolutely. Um, do you see this as, I mean, you, you manufacture gear. Do you see this as a good thing, a bad thing, or a, a non-news thing? Well, it's, it's very hard to have a competition when, uh, y- you know, you, the athletes are, are so restricted by, by boat choice, you, you know? I mean, ima- name another sport where, you know, if you're sponsored by a certain boat company with a, with a fast boat design, you're going to win that race, you, you know? or right. people. I mean, if you're sponsored by Tuna, what are you going to – they don't make a green boat. They don't make a stinger. Right. You know? Um, what's, how, do you, how do you deal with that? I mean, the only way I could see to make a fair competition in this sense is, is that, that your boat sponsorship has to be left at the door and everyone races the same boat. Mm-hmm. Or they can, they, everyone can pick from one of three or four boat designs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, that would be troubling. That would, that would, it would be hard for a lot of sponsored athletes to actually do that. You know, it would be a, a break of contract, I'm sure, with a lot of a lot of people. Yeah, but um, there's no way. How are you going to have a fair competition without that? No, I agree. Now, what do you think about? I looked on there. That some of some boats that are plastic and are under the nine foot range and within the weight range are also uh, excluded, like the um, Dagger GT and the Liquid Logic Brap. What do you think about that? Why would they, I mean? Is it for safety reasons? Is that what they're what they're suggesting? I don't know. I there, there's there's a, maybe maybe Olaf or or some of the crew will hear this podcast and answer that. I I, I really don't know. I I I personally have a party wrap and know that it's built strongly. It has grab loops. It's got foam pillars. I know that it's within that weight range. Um, I'm wondering, do people deem that is a unsafe boat? That, I mean, what, are, what else could it be? I can't think of another reason why to make a, a boat like that. If otherwise fits the requirements, not legal to race. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Well, in that case, I'm against that rule because that really takes away the elements of design. And I'm just going to lay out my opinion on creek boat design. I think that as boats got shorter, you know, originally they were a lot longer, less rocker. They got shorter, and it, and it seemed like people moved down to, uh, you know, all the way down to seven and a half foot, eight foot boats. People put a whole lot of rocker in them, like the Descent and several other boats. And I think there is people designers went past, and they went too far into the um, design that's really bulbous and your kind of your typical creaker shape. Whereas right. I, I think you can still have the safety elements, but you're really losing a lot of your performance in that traditional, what I would call a creek boat design. I, I, I think the creek boat is going to be in five or six years more of a blend of the river runner and the creek boat and not such a um, bulbous boat. So in my opinion, which is not my race, and let me, let me, let me also say it's Olaf's race. He can, he can put whatever rules he wants in there. If you got to wear a tutu to race, that's the rules, you know. Um, having said that, I think that if you can't take a boat that is a non-traditional shape, like a Brap or a Dagger GTX or whatever, and race it, well, I'm not sure that's going to help any of the manufacturers make better creek boats. I mean, it's a race on a creek, so you'd think the faster boat, the boat that performed better, would be a better creek racing boat. Um, what, what are your thoughts there? I don't think creek boat manuf- I don't think boat manufacturers look at the sick line race as any kind of target market in yeah. terms of boat design. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I think at the end of the day, it, it, you know, I think people are excited to go to the sick line race and their careers aren't depending on it. It's not like they're going to the Olympics or anything like that. Uh, I mean, obviously they want to do well, but 
as it stands right now, if if you're going to be beholden to your boat company, this is it, it's good. It's not. It's it can't be a very serious race. You can't you can't leave that race saying you're the fastest person. Yeah. You know, you can leave that race saying you're fast and you also had the best boat for that course. Right, right. No, I hear you. Well, I mean it's an interesting, you know, I just saw that post and I thought it was worthy of a little bit of discussion. And uh I don't know, that's super interesting the the slalom background and, and back in the day making boats. How many boats did you make in your boat building career, John? Two hundred and seventy five boats. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's one word for it. <laughs> and, 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 and all of those were glass layup or composite material layup. Yeah, that's right. There, there was uh, slalom, slalom and downriver race boats. Yep. Uh, okay, moving on. And this is uh, a fully unsolicited topic. Yes. And I believe I titled it in the show notes, um, "The Brap." Is this the boat that saved Whitewater? Hmm. You mean the party brat, not I to mean, be confused with the brat. I, I specifically do mean the party brat. Let me rephrase that. The party yeah. brat, is this the boat that saved Whitewater? So let's let's just clarify that for people out there who aren't familiar with the party brat. Okay. This is you, – you, you, I'm sure you know more of the mechanics of this than I do. It's a, they, they, do they put some weight on the back of a boat, of a regular brat as it comes out of the tool, right? Uh, essentially, yes. You know, it's a, I think it, it's a little more complicated process than that. But yeah, it's got some different size pillars and this and that. But basically, it's a regular brat, comes out of the same mold, but in the cooling process, the stern, there's, I think, five gallons taken out of the stern. Right. Well, I, I think it's an interesting question. I'll tell you why. Because uh, the past seven or eight years, I think there's been some stagnation in boat design. Right. And I think it's for a couple of reasons. One, I think we kind of plateaued in terms of in terms of boat evolution, making, you know, boat design, making a huge jump up in skill set. I think in the late 90s, and early 2000s, we were seeing boat shapes change so much from year to year. Uh, you know, it was almost imperative for you to be doing the latest steepest rivers or the newest play tricks to have a new boat. Right. And that 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 started to fade away as we came into the past 10 years or so. We're basically a nomad was as just a good a creek boat as you could get. Um, and I think there's some stagnation there. And I think people fell into, customers fell into this, this, this habit where they just get a creek boat and uh, that would be their primary boat. Mm-hmm. And they'd paddle the upper yacht or, or um, the Watauga or whatever they're, you know, most people do class three, four, you know, whitewater. That's the staple of, of their, of their boating career is that kind of stuff. And they'd be doing this in a creek boat. Um, and I think, Part of this is fueled also by, you know, the, the superstars of the sport who are pushing boat brands and like Evan and the Tuna and Dave uh, and the 9R, um, and who've done a phenomenal job of marketing themselves and the boats they paddle. And I think there's some aspirational qualities to people getting creek boats, um, you know, and people would love to to be paddling, you know, Class 5 and 70-foot waterfalls and going to Pucone and stakeen and whatnot but the reality is is that we're paddling a lot of us are just paddling class four easy five white water you know at the most and then along comes the party brap which i mean it is not this you know it's not a radical departure from say an axiom or even an rpm but at the same time i think in my opinion and i did have an opportunity to paddle one here quite a bit in the past week or so it's probably one of the best plastic designs I have ever paddled for general river running. I, I will 100% agree with that. Okay, continue. I don't know what exactly happened with that design. Um, I think it's definitely along a tradition of shame and liquid logic, really, really honing in on river running, uh, starting with like the remix boats, which were great boats. Um, and this sort of being an extension of that. Um, and I think Pat Keller, I think who's, probably one of the most talented kayakers who's who's ever lived having some influence in that design as well but they knocked it out of the park they really knocked it out of the park with this one um well i know that i got my hands on one not too long back and it's pretty much the only boat i paddle at this point and you know i'll pretty much take it anywhere it's it has what i like about it and Number one, I can very comfortably wear my shoes, fit in it fine. Number two, 
it runs the river without, um, it doesn't make the river harder. Um, whereas there are a lot of designs that are playful, it is a little harder to run the river in them. Um, so th this boat runs all the white water just fine, but you can tap into a lot of the surf and squirting and play that um, you just can't get in a boat that runs the river that easily. And that's the best way I can sum it up. I felt like I was suddenly linking, you know, running a rapid and linking tricks like I was on a skateboard. Yeah. Um, I was splatting rocks. I was doing quick attainments into stern squirts. I was surfing in possibly short, tiny waves. And it, I felt like I was seeing the river in full color again after years of seeing it sort of in black and white creek boat vision. And I, I don't think it's, I mean, I, and obviously I think the guys they, they did a wonderful job designing this boat, but I think the point is that, that this could hearken a, a, a new era of, of river running. Uh, which was your original question, yeah. you know, and I think when people start to look at the river again with, with that, with those kind of maneuvers in mind, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be great for our sport. No, I agree. And, 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 and let's face it, there are so many impediments to getting into kayak. So many things that are a roadblock from having to flip upside down and all sorts of things that if you get in a comfortable boat that r makes the rapids easy and is playable at the same time, I think, I don't know. It just seems like a winner to me. And it's, I mean, I'm, I, this is totally unsolicited. I know that you have no affiliation with liquid logic and I just kudos to that boat. And I think that it's going to do good things for the entire sport. People are going to get in it and want to keep kayaking. So that's, that's kind of my summary. I agree. I would agree with that hundred percent. So what's, so let's let, talk to me about IR. Here's your free airtime. What's going on at IR? Oh, we are splitting the atom over here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, nothing, man. It's it's making kayaking gear. You know, we've we've uh, we're coming up our twentieth year making kayaking gear. We, wow. I think, we are the last standalone whitewater gear company. Certainly, in the United States. And, you know, we're not making gear for any other sport. We're not making gear for kayak fishermen. We're not making gear for sailing we're not making gear for it's whitewater you listen know? to that that is a very cool statement for anyone who's a whitewater enthusiast that enthusiast and who's been around for a while that should resonate that is very, that is yep. very cool 20 years oh my god i feel old yeah tell me about it but well, uh in the thing we've realized is that uh it's a big challenge to make really good whitewater gear you know it's really really hard to do i don't think customers realize how tough they are on gear um, but <laughs> I think we're starting to learn a little bit at least, but yeah, spray skirts, dry tops, dry suits. That's what it's all about. Well, I know how tough I am on gear. I've definitely been yeah. my first year and I hardly ever get to go paddling anymore. Um, I want to give a shout out to a piece of gear that you have that I got my hands on is the Royal Flush spray skirt. Right. So it kind of goes hand in hand with paddling the party brap. Yeah. Is that, uh. You know, you're you get water in your boat when you're, you know, you're slicing your sterns and you're cartwheeling and you know and whatever and you're flipping over. And I don't get any water in my boat with the Royal Flush. How did you figure that out? What like? What well, I, you know, listen, I got to give credit where credits due. Just went more. You know, is our principal R and D guy here. He's probably the most experienced skirt builder in the world. I mean, he started building skirts of mountain surf. 25 years ago, uh, you know, when you think about a Rand skirt, that's Jess Whittemore. When you think about a Kevlar skirt, that's Jess Whittemore. He, he brought, he, he invented both of those things. Um, and you know, I think the Royale is his, the latest iteration of that creation. Um, you know, and the thing is that Rand shape in particular, and this is a, this is a, a point I think it's worth making. It, it's designed to take into account how many poor rim designs there are out there. Um, many people are quick to blame a, a water in their boat due to a spray skirt leaking, but you'd be surprised how many times is the rim is just a poor shaped rim. Right. Um, uh, I think EJ, to his credit, makes a, he is very concerned about water in a boat. He's also very tuned into the fact that a poorly shaped rim design leads to water in the boat more than anything else. And so I think he set a standard. Uh, in that regard, and I think some boat manufacturers need to start living up to that. Um, you know, the party brap, as much as I love Shane as a boat designer, the party brap has the same 
big space around the seat bolt cavities, uh, which will it was very hard to keep dry. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And all the liquid logic whitewater boats have that same configuration. Um, you need a uniform cockpit rim all the way around the boat to keep water out. Um, but the Royale is designed to, to try and make up for that and its counterpart, the Klingon. Does, um, it, does it bother you that I call it the Royal Flush all the time? Uh, no, it, I'm used to it. It'd be like uh, uh, someone, I don't know. Yes, no, it doesn't. I hear that all the time. <laughs> I don't, even, I don't even pay attention to it anymore. Well, I literally – people are, people ask me about it and I'll be like, yeah, this is the Royal Flush. It's IR. So I'm, yeah. I'm just wondering how many people call you up or send you an email. Hey, I couldn't find that Royal Flush on your website. No, it's – yeah, that's it's, – yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, props Thank to you, you and Jess, man. It's a sick piece of gear. And in my Liquid Logic boat, it's dry, sh- dry as can be. So anyway. Good. Big, Mission accomplished. Big props to you on that. Um, all right, so now I'm going to shift gears away from whitewater, and I'm going to get into some mountain biking. Um, for a lot of the viewers out there, our pro media production company, um, amongst it, we work in several different different industries other than whitewater. Um, we can't pay the bills if we just worked in whitewater. <laughs> so, yeah, but <laughs> we get to we get back to the thing where there's not many whitewater <laughs> companies left. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. having said that, we do manage to do a pretty good job of keeping it in the outdoors, which is what we really love around here. Um, yeah. one thing, a local company here in Asheville, uh, Kane Creek called us up and we are helping them put on an event. We're essentially running it for them, a mountain bike dual slalom. Have you ever heard of that, John? I have. I, I mean, I, I, yes, I have. So anyway, dual slalom was the rage in probably back when you were just starting your company. Um, it was, this was before mountain bike downhill and whatever, and it just kind of left and it kind of went away. So anyway, Red Bull put on this big event out at this uh, Oscar Blues ranch. Uh, it's this big ranch out by DuPont State Forest. None of that probably means anything to you. But anyway, they had these huge jumps. I'm talking like 20 foot tall jumps that maybe 50 riders in the world could do. Well, when Red Bull was done, all of a sudden there was this course that was unrideable by anybody. So we went in there, leveled the thing, and made a dual slalom course. Well, when they contacted me, they're like, you know, we'll get some volunteers. It'll be easy. It won't be a big deal for you. I said, okay. You know, and this was, we had about four weeks to get ready for the event. Well, let me just tell you, putting two tracks side by side and making them flow and basically be the same time from start to finish is about a nightmare. So anyway, yeah. we got yeah, it done. I don't understand that. How does that work? I don't even understand how that works. And when you say we, I mean, what is this, you and a couple of dudes with a tractor? I mean, what, what's that, the... That's exactly what it was. Some of, there was some volunteers, some guys from uh, Brevard College, some of the racing teams, some some other kids, and a couple of guys out at, uh, out at Oscar Blues. Uh, we had a really good guy operating the skits, uh, skid steer his name is mike thomas and we went out there with shovels and a weekend and we just made it happen and you know what you have to do is you have to have an inside berm and an outside burn so every left hand turn to level out the time you have to have a right hand turn you know and so when, when you when you race these things do you do two times one goes inside one goes outside exactly and exactly and then you do bracket format and you eliminate all the way down the thing so there's some good things about it. Everybody gets a time trial run in at least two runs. So even if you've never, you're just horrible and whatever, you're still going to get three runs of this custom built course. So that's you know that's a good thing. And, and what's how long does it take? Like typical race time. Top I'm going to say the fast guys are going to be about forty seconds, and the slower people are going to be around a minute maybe. Hmm. Um, so it's a sprint. It's a it's a sprint event. But anyway, long story short, we took this unrunnable course and we're doing a dual slalom and i've put on events like enduro events in the green river games and other mountain biking events but this will be my first one in dual slalom so i'm i don't know we're gonna see what happens how many people are gonna show up to race this thing we got like 70 people signed up and we got i I bet we're gonna end up with probably i don't know i'd say between 80 and 90 people what happens if it pours rain is that it it's over it's done it, no we'll, we're gonna race in the rain but it's gonna be 70 degrees and sunny so we're not worried about that <laughs> anyway there's gonna be lots of beers people can camp it's gonna be a good time out at the cane creek 
dual slalom challenge. You should bring the kids down and race. Yeah, well, the kids would like it. That's for sure. All right, now, now for our viewers, uh, you know, I'm going to try and do this as a video podcast. Sorry, I just uh, dropped train of thought here. I'm going to try and do this as a video podcast, but it may just be an audio podcast. But I'm saying viewers because I'm planning on, at this point, making it a video podcast. So anyway, now for our viewers, favorite part of the show, the mm-hmm. rants and raves. Yes. So would you like to do a rant or would you like to do a rave? And whatever you do, I'll do the opposite. Okay. Well, I'm going to do, I'm going to do a rant because uh, I think I did a rave already about the, the party brat. Okay. Fair enough. So this will give me an opportunity to, to, to go both ways on this. So I even, you know, and honestly, I even realized this was a part of the show, but uh, I have one ready to go. Okay. Let's hear it. You ready? Yeah. My rant is against this new generation of super short, low offset paddles. Guys who are six feet tall paddling 194s or something cockamamie like that with a 30 degree or less offset. Okay. Okay. All right. Yep. Okay. So go on. Continue. All right. All right. Um, So here's the thing, right? So the first thing is I, you know, I still teach kayaking from time to time and I see these people come out with these paddles. And instead of getting a control hand, you know, you have a right-hand control hand and your other hand would slide easily on the paddle. Mm -hmm, They grip mm -hmm. the paddle with both hands equally. And so they're cocking their wrist back and forth when they paddle. They don't – there's no sliding hand. You you follow me? Okay. All right. So that's problem A, right? Problem B is you get a a low offset paddle, like 30 degrees. You go to do like a front draw stroke or, you know, like really nuanced feathered bow draw. Yep. Uh, your the, the the paddle shaft the grip placement's terrible for that kind of stuff, um, and, and so I think that's that's two things. And then the third thing, the short paddles, there's no power in these. I mean, the, the RPMs these guys are throwing out are so high. Uh, you know, I it it seems to me I don't know who's starting this. I'm not sure if, if I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's Danny Mungo at Werner who's behind this conspiracy. <laughs> it very well may be. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he needs to cut it out. And all you people out there, you need to get a 45 degree offset paddle. And if you're six feet, you should be paddling around a 200 centimeter paddle. Period. Well, I'll agree with that. Now, let me just kind of rebuttal you up here a little bit. Yeah. So I do use a 200 to 204 paddle. That's um, right. I, That's I right. use a and, longer paddle. But, and you're an exceptionally good paddler. May but, I point out. but I have steadily moved from originally a 90 to a 60 to a 45 to a 30 and i'm considering going all the way down to a 15 degree blade that's heartbreaking let me tell you why Mm. because Mm. i i if you if you have a loose grip when you paddle you don't have to hold both hands tight do you know what i'm saying it's just that's not but that's not what's happening. These guys are holding both hands tight on these 30-degree offset paddles. Yeah, but they probably suck it all their life, not just holding their paddle. So, well, this is allowing them to suck in this particular area. <laughs> it's a very hard habit to break as an instructor. I'm going to cut it out, and they can't. can't stop. It doesn't but, make any sense to them. But let me tell you this. When you're doing a back deck roll or sweeping around, not having a big feather on your paddle makes it easier. I will tell you. I will say that. And – and, 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 I'm just saying I have moved this direction. Now I may not get past that 30. I just recently got a new Odachi and it's 30 and I love it and I just want to hold it and I love it. So I you know I'm not raising uh, – we're both raising children, John Grace, <laughs> and I do not want them to be raised in a world where 15-degree offset, 192-centimeter paddles are the norm. <laughs> but, I don't want them to see that. But, but let me agree with you on the length of the paddle. Yeah. I, yeah. There is nothing that looks sillier than watching somebody have to reach down to get their paddle in the water. Thank I mean, you. I mean, I, it just looks – not only is it ineffective, not only do you not have the ability to reach as far back or get a good as a catch or you know get a stern draw as effectively, it just That's looks right. silly. You're like reaching over. It's like you're bobbing from side to side to try and grab the water. Yeah, I 100% agree with you there. And I'll tell you what, I think that a 200 for us is about your minimum for a six foot tall person. Absolutely, 202, you know? 204. That's where they should be at. It's exactly. So, anyway, good, good rant, good rant. So right. let's see. You had a rant. So I'm gonna, 
<sighs> I'm going to go with a rave then. I had a rant prepared. I did not have a rave prepared because mm. I thought you were for sure going to go on to the rave for our first show. But anyway. Yeah. Well, you know me. Um, all right. Here we go. So here's a rave. And this is whitewater related. I had a uh, I had a rant mountain biking related, but I'm gonna I'm gonna stick I'm gonna I'm gonna move to a rave and I'm gonna jump back over to whitewater. American whitewater. The American whitewater is an incredible organization for doing as much as they do with as little as they have. I have. This year at the Green Race, we're partnering with American Whitewater, and I was talking with Kevin Colburn about some of the issues they're dealing with and whatnot. And they are they are fighting so many battles on so many fronts with so little resources and winning. It's ridiculous. I, you know, I, it's just amazing that I don't know how many members they have, 4,000 people who actually give them money or something. But they do so much if you look at – Everything from the Gali to the Chioa to the Feather to wherever you want to look across the country. These people have done more for the sport and more for whitewater paddling than I would say all other. I, I don't know anybody who'd be even close to them. For instance, right now, did you know that the relicensing of the Akoe River um, is on the table? And the TVA, which is a government organization wants to take the water, the public's water, and sell it back to the public for recreational use at more than a hundred times the cost that they would, that what they would earn of putting it through the tubes to make electricity. Nobody that does even, not surprise me. Nobody even knows this. And, and it's not even a private company doing it. It's the government. It's the TVA doing it. And who's right there making sure that we're at the table and going to keep that from happening? AW, you know, these are the kind of things that aren't glamorous. They're not cool. They're not, you know, they're just, they're just not something that's going to get shared all over social media or, you know, it's, I, I probably wouldn't have even brought it up on this podcast if you wouldn't have picked a rant. So anyway, well, I couldn't, I couldn't disagree more, John. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. Of course I'm kidding. Listen, here's what we're going to do. And I need to prepare my customers. And I think everyone in this industry should prepare for this as well. I propose that we have a mandatory pro deal tax that when you pro deal a piece of kayaking gear, that there is a tax that goes directly to AW. I think that's huge. Many other sports do that. Well, I think we should be taxed the God out of these pro dealers. <laughs> I think they're <laughs> moochers. Stick to those no, guys. This, <laughs> this should be something that the entire industry should adopt wholeheartedly at once without complaint. I mean, we all have the infrastructure to do it. Everybody, you know, everyone from, from seals to Kokatat to IR to confluence to the whole kit and caboodle. We all have the ability to do it. We just need to do it. Mm. I, I agree a hundred percent. Maybe that is something that will catch on or at least, uh, you know, maybe is, have you ever suggested that to Mark or any of the guys over there? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mark and I talk about this frequently. It's just a matter of, I, I think, they're, they're so busy, they don't really have the time to to put it all together. But I'm, I'm making a call right now. Well, I like it. need to do this. Well, all right. Well, I think that probably should wrap up our first de debacle here in the podcast world. I promise we'll get better, viewers. <laughs> yes. Baby uh, steps. Listen, baby, baby I can steps. make a request. Yeah. We need to take uh, start with, with ma mail answering questions. And then even taking calls. I think we should evolve to that. Okay, I, want we, to talk to, I want to talk to the people. I need okay. to set them straight on, on certain things. Okay. Okay. Again, baby steps. Let's do um, a Q&A. Uh, we'll yeah. put this thing online. Yeah. Um, we'll do some questions. You and I will look through and pick one or two questions out of there or five or six questions, whatever we can do. Yeah. Um, and, and we'll add that. And then phone calls are certainly an option um, in the very near future. And then we'll kind of go from there and maybe we can blend the comments, concerns, and questions that we have online with getting them answered by making a phone call. So right. That's what I'm thinking. Maybe we'll make some magic happen. Okay. Well, I appreciate the time, John, and maybe we'll do something cool in the future. Stakeen. Next fall. Stakeen. It's my project. <laughs>